Hello, my name is Melanie Moon, and I'm continuing reading Race in the City. I'm now on Chapter 8, which is entitled James Hathaway Robinson and the Origins of Professional Social Work in the Black Community. It's written by Andrea Tuttle Cornblue. In Cincinnati, as in many other northern cities, the early 20th century brought with it both a growing number of African-American urban dwellers and attempts to organize the black community to meet the needs of both newcomers and longtime citizens of the city. Pioneer black sociologists and social workers of this era developed theories and programs to help them better organize families and communities to provide for improved employment opportunities housing, health, recreation, and education. Acutely aware of racial discrimination, they sought the reformation of a prejudiced judicial system and improved race relations. This work, often initiated by branches or affiliates of the National Urban League, characteristically began with a survey of conditions in the black community. In Cincinnati, the Council of Social Agencies, or CSA, funded such a survey by a young black sociologist, James Hathaway Robinson. This study of Robinson's education, his survey, and his plan for social work in Cincinnati's African American community provides a detailed illustration of how these early professional social workers described the nature of the problems facing the black community and how they sought to use social science to solve these problems. For Robinson and his contemporaries, improved race relations did not mean the racial integration of individuals, but rather the development of black institutions and their influence in the larger pluralistic community. James Hathaway Robinson, educated at Fisk, Yale, and Columbia, was hired by the Cincinnati Council of Social Agencies in 1917 to make a survey of black migration to the city and of the housing conditions of the black community. The survey and Robinson's subsequent recommendations for social work in the city's black community guided the council's work for the next 30 years. Robinson developed a two-pronged attack on the problems facing the black community. He described two distinct but interconnected tasks organizing the black community internally, and then making that community as a group an equal participant in the larger metropolitan community. He ranked programs for both of these areas as equally important and said they needed to be pursued simultaneously. Both Robinson and the Negro Civic Welfare Committee, NCWC, which he created, said the programs should develop social welfare services for the black community and build interracial goodwill and understanding by emphasizing the equality of blacks as a cultural group and their desire for equal services. These programs included, but were not limited to, the housing of the first national conference on interracial, the hosting of the first national conference on interracial goodwill held in Cincinnati in 1925, the regular celebration of Race Relations Sunday, and annual interracial dinners. This strategy for improving black-white relations in northern urban society in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s can be viewed as one manifestation of the concept of cultural pluralism, quote unquote. In those years, this idea gained favor with Americans interested in explaining how American society was or ought to be organized. Cultural plural pluralism appeared to provide a way to a talk about America as one country one culture, 
composed of a series of equal or potentially equal subunits, variously defined as regions, racial and ethnic groups, occupational and professional groups, and gender-based groups. Thus, social welfare organizers in Cincinnati, as in other cities, sought to develop comprehensive organizations representative of all the groups in the city. It was as members of groups, not as individuals, that citizens ought to seek representation. These social welfare advocates envisioned a pluralistic community based on cooperation among a diverse variety of groups and the coordination of their activities. In Cincinnati, in 1913, the Council of Social Agencies began putting together such a pluralistic and representative body. The CSA took took as its responsibility the centralization of the city's private and public social work activities, and to this end, it organized investigations of social conditions, initiated new agencies, and conducted an annual joint fundraising campaign for affiliated agencies. In 1916, the Associated Charities, an umbrella group, of Protestant social service agencies joined the joint fundraising efforts of the CSA. The Bureau of Catholic Charities followed in 1917 and in 1918 the United Jewish Social Agencies added its forces to the CSA. Agencies serving immigrants such as the Immigrant Welfare Committee and the Santa Maria Institute which was devoted to meeting the needs of the city's Italian community, also belonged to the CSA. In 1917, the CSA's fundraising included two agencies that served the African American community, the Walnut Hills Day Nursery and the Home for Colored Girls. Unlike the Bureau of Catholic Charities, or the United Jewish Social Agencies, however, no coordinating body existed to centralize the work of those social service agencies serving the African American community. As a first step toward including the black community, the CSA undertook an investigation of what it referred to as the Negro problem, quote unquote, and hired James Hathaway Robinson to make a survey of black migration to Cincinnati and the local housing situation facing the black community. James Hathaway Robinson was probably the Cincinnatian best suited to directing the council survey of black life. The son of an ex-slave, Robinson was born in 1887 in Sharpsburg, Bath County, Kentucky. He attended school in Winchester and Lexington, Kentucky, and at the age of 19 enrolled at Fisk University. During his last year at Fisk, the school added a new department of social science devoted to the study of race relations. George Edmund Haynes, a black sociologist who in 1910 had confounded, had co-founded the committee on urban conditions among Negroes, which in, in 1911 became the National Urban League, headed the new department. From Fisk, Robinson went to Yale, where he received his master's degree and completed his residency requirements for a Ph.D. in sociology in 1914. The National Urban League awarded Robinson a fellow to attend the Graduate School of Columbia University to study sociology and social science in 1914 to 1915. In the fall of 1915, he moved to Cincinnati, where he settled into a black neighborhood in Walnut Hills and began teaching sixth grade at the Douglas School. Robinson told Wendell P. Dabney, a newspaper editor and chronicler of Black Cincinnati, that he had turned down offers to teach at Fisk, Strait, Morehouse, Georgia State, and Nalden in order to come to Cincinnati, but he did not describe what had attracted him to the Queen City. 
It should be noted, however, that at that time, Cincinnati's African-American community was an object of interest to black scholars of national repute. For example, the first issue of the premier volume of the Journal of Negro History, published in January 1916, carried an article by Carter G. Woodson titled, The Negroes of Cincinnati Prior to the Civil War. By the time that Robinson began teaching at Douglas, it was the only remaining all-black public school left in Cincinnati from the 19th century. <clears throat> colored school system. Quote, colored school. All the black children in the city did not attend Douglas, but the school did have an all-black teaching staff and the largest single concentration of black students in the district. And the year before Robinson began to teach at Douglas, Jenny Davis Porter, who taught at Douglas from about 1900 to 1914, left her position at the Walnut Hill School and began her campaign to develop for the West End a quote-unquote separate public school, Harriet Beecher Stowe School, <clears throat> and my dad attended Stowe dedicated to the interests of black students in this most rapidly growing black neighborhood in the city. The Douglas School, where Robinson began his teaching career, was impressive. A new building had been constructed in 1910 by the school board at a cost of $167,871. The building included 15 classroom, classrooms, an auditorium, gymnasium, library, lunchroom, open air room, neighborhood club room, boys and girls shower rooms, manual training and domestic science rooms, laundry room, model flat, and sewing room, and seats for 800 pupils. In 1913, the board's annual report contended that Douglas School was, quote, one of our finest modern school buildings and perhaps the best equipped in the city for industrial training, unquote, footnote. But when the board emphasized the industrial training offered students at Douglas, the faculty of 32 also included specialists in kindergarten work, German, music, writing, art, and physical education. <clears throat> the Douglas School attracted natural, national attention, and R. H. Leval, a journalist for The Outlook, a national magazine that called itself, quote, an illustrated weekly journal of current events, unquote, visited the school during the First World War to discover, quote, what the Negro asks of white America in the ways of a fighting chance to win democracy, unquote. At the main entrance to the Douglas School, Level reported, hung, quote, four huge placards that confront the visitor, unquote. These proclaimed the following slogans, quote, self-control, self-reliance, self-respect, and race pride, unquote. Level noted that the example of Douglas School represented, quote, the chance to teach the world the supreme truth that democracy means not the wiping out of racial personality, but rather the cherishing of racial difference and the enabling of diverse stocks for the enrichment of us all. End quote. Lovell also argued that black parents preferred to send their children to Douglas rather than to racially mixed schools, and that, quote, the colored community is overwhelmingly in favor of the separate school, unquote. The journalist did not devote much space to an examination of the regular school day. Instead, he concentrated his report on the ways in which the school f functioned as a community center. In the evenings, the school offered nightly sessions of, quote, the Rough House, unquote, a supervised program for such activities as basketball and boxing. 
This resulted, Level thought, in the development of teamwork and democratic spirit rather than the formation of quote-unquote tough gangs, which could result in an undirected quote-unquote overflow of vitality. The school also provided quiet reading, evening entertainment such as checkers and crocodile as well as a community branch of the public library. A night school made training available in academic and industrial subjects and offered gym classes for men and women. I'm sure that that's what my father participated in to get his, um, to finish his, um, I don't think it was high school. I think it was grade school. Maybe it was high school. But I know he went to school in the evenings at Stowe. And as a matter of fact, there was a picture, I don't know that I'd be able to find it now, of his graduating class. Douglas School also provided space for many neighborhood clubs. Clubs for house servants, for factory girls, for young men, for girls in high school, and for girls in the university. When Robinson arrived at Douglas School, Frances M. Russell was the principal. Ah, that name sounds familiar. And he had held the position since 1909. Russell, born in 1879 in Knoxville, Tennessee, attended the University of Cincinnati, where he received his B.A. in 1904 and his M.A. in 1906. A member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the Masons, and the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, uh uh-oh, Russell taught in black public schools in two Kentucky cities just across the river, the Ohio River. First a teacher at Covington High School, 1904 to 05, he went on to become a principal in Newport, Kentucky, 1905 to 09, before going on to Douglas. My, my maternal grandfather uh, came over from Newport, Kentucky, and his father was an, uh, an educator. I believe he was a principal. I'm going to have to ask my sister. She's 10 years older than I am, and she'll know. In 1914, Russell became one of the 12 first members of the Board of Trustees of the privately supported Cincinnati Colored Industrial School, which had been established in that year. Russell also played a role in the establishment of the Ninth Street Branch Colored of the y- Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA. So the YMCA was, was segregated. In 1913, this black branch of the YMCA opened a 7th and Plum Street, opened at 7th and Plum Streets. The Ninth Street building erected in 1915 with the financial support of the Chicago philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, opened in 1916. Russell served as one of the 12 original members, all black, of that branch's committee of management. Along with the creation of this all black branch came a change in the YMCA's organizational structure. The minutes of the YMCA of Cincinnati for December 21st, 1916, record a, quote, change in organization to the so-called metropolitan basis, which places in the hands of a committee of management for each branch, including the central branch, the responsibility for the work of each branch with a common treasurer and board of directors. The members of the committee begin appointed, being appointed by the president of the board, unquote. By 1919, the black physician, Dr. William T. Nelson, had become, according to the historian of the Cincinnati YMCA, quote, the first Negro to be named a member of any 
YMCA Metropolitan Board of Directors, unquote. The new organizational structure thus allowed both for the separate black branch and a racially integrated leadership body composed of representatives from all branches of the city. Level noted in his article that 11 out of the 28 Douglas teachers he surveyed came from the South. In fact, most came from the North, and several of them came from families that had lived in Cincinnati for generations and composed the Queen City's Black aristocracy. Amelia C. Taylor, a second grade teacher at Douglas and her sister, Hetty G. Taylor, a first grade teacher, were dis descended from pioneer citizens of Cincinnati, William and Amelia Beckley. E. Camille Fryason, who taught third grade, was the daughter of Harry H. Fryason and Lucy Armstrong. Mr. Fryason was born in 1866 in Cincinnati, the son of Augustus, a fireman, and Elizabeth. He attended the Cincinnati Public Schools and Gaines High School, which opened in 1866 and served as the city's only high school for black students and was an important training ground for future teachers until 1887, when the state legislature tried to eliminate segregated schools. A Republican and a Mason, Fryerson was also the treasurer and steward of Brown Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Walnut Hills. He held a variety of jobs, including a term as a clerk in the county recorder's office, as an inspector in the improvement department of the waterworks, and in the engineer's department, and as an assistant city paymaster. Neola E. Woodson, who, along with Camille Fryerson, taught third grade at Douglas, was also descended from an old Cincinnati family. Her parents were Cassie Guthrie Woodson and Jesse J. Woodson, and her paternal grandparents, Jesse and Patsy Ann Woodson, lived in Cincinnati when her father was born in 1861. Like Fryerson, Jesse Woodson had attended public school and Gaines High School. He was a trustee of the Brown Chapel AME Church and belonged to the Knights of Pythias, Lodge No. 32, and F&AM St. John Lodge No. 8, a trustee of the Board of the Colored Orphan Asylum for 12 years, and the Home for Aged Colored Women, established in 1891. Jesse Woodson also was a member of the Committee of Management of the YMCA and a member of the NAACP, established in 1915. Woodson had a 45 had a 40-year career with the U.S. Postal Service as a letter carrier. His daughter, Neola, the Douglas teacher, received her B.A. from the University of Cincinnati. Neola Woodson married James Hathaway Robinson in 1916. Douglas School and its faculty were intimately involved in the history of Cincinnati and in the development of leadership for the African American community. This institution and its faculty had ties to the separate 19th century colored school system and such old community institutions as the Brown Chapel AME Church and the Home for the Aged Colored Women, both like Douglas in Walnut Hills. The school and its faculty also participated in the new developments of the early 20th century, such as the movement to establish school social centers and the creation of new all-black branches of existing institutions, such as the Ninth Street branch of the YMCA and the Harriet Beecher Stowe School. In 1915, when James Hathaway Robinson arrived at Douglas School, it was perhaps the largest center of organized black community activity in the city. Robinson's two-year stay there provided him with employment, 
a spouse, and an insider's understanding of Cincinnati's African-American community. Francis Russell, the principal at Douglas, may have been responsible for the CSA's hiring of Robinson to make the survey. Russell, as a member of the Board of Managers of the Black Knight Street YMCA, would have known that known of both Robinson's training in sociology and the desire of social welfare groups to study the condition of Cincinnati's black community. In at least one account, the 9th Street YMCA is given credit for the existence of the organization Robinson founded. The historian of the Cincinnati YMCA notes that Robinson's organization emerged from the 9th Street Branch Employment and Welfare Department. The general secretary of the Cincinnati YMCA, who oversaw the creation of the 9th Street Branch, was Alfred Gittner. Book Walter, who also served as the YMCA representative to the CSA. Book Walter became an active organizer for the NCWA and served as its first chairman. Book Walter was also a member of the CSA's Centralized Budget Committee. The idea for the Negro Civic Welfare Association may have come from the 9th Street branch of the YMCA, but the money for the survey was raised by the CSA. In the fall of 1916, the CSA's Central Budget Committee noted that, quote, the entire colored situation seems to be in a chaotic state in Cincinnati, unquote. To remedy this, the Budget Committee recommended earmarking $5,000, quote, to secure a comprehensive plan, unquote, for the work of the black community. The CSA's January 1917 fund drive included solicitations for a, quote, special fund for colored work, unquote, describing the need as follows, quote, the work among the colored people is so much disorganized that many givers have requested a complete reorganization of this work. The Central Budget Committee did not allow any increases in organizations doing work among the colored people, but estimate that the reorganization will cost $5,000." Unquote. A. G. Bookman of the YMCA and the CSA announced the CSA's plan to survey the quote-unquote Negro problem in May 1917, and Robinson released his preliminary results in July of that year. He chronicled the reasons new migrants gave for leaving the South, their religious and economic backgrounds, the housing conditions they found in the Queen City, and the programs of the social service agencies that tried to serve their needs. Robinson argued that the primary cause for the migration of massive numbers of Southern blacks to the North was economic. Out of 40 migrants, 27 said they had come north for better wages. Six for, quote-unquote, better privileges. Five, quote-unquote, to better condition. Two, because of, quote-unquote, bad treatment in the South. And one, quote-unquote, just took a notion. These statistics, Robinson wrote, quote, corroborate a mass of evidence from other sources that the movement is primarily economic, unquote. He outlined specific economic causes in the South, low wages, high prices, the disadvantages of the crop lean system, probably referring to sharecropping, and that's, uh, that is a quotation, flood destruction, and the boll weevil. On the northern end of the equation, a scarcity of labor had caused had been created by both the expansion of industry and the dearth of foreign immigrants. At this moment, Robinson wrote, came the labor agents from the north offering the Negro wages of which he had never dreamed and privileges of which he had only read in the Constitution. And that's a quote. Once the movement began, enthusiastic letters home from early migrants helped to swell the numbers.
unquote footnote. Cincinnati played a unique role in what Robinson referred to as, quote, this great folk wandering, unquote, for he suggested that the Queen City served, quote, as a junction where migrants from different points in the South are distributed to other points in the North rather than as a terminus, unquote. Cincinnati, Robinson thought, was too near the South from which the migrants were fleeing and did not offer the attractive wages that could be found in northern cities like Cleveland, Chicago, and Pittsburgh. As a gateway to the South, he said, many pass through, but most of them make their way to northern Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and New York. Robinson made a one-week study of the migrants arriving in Cincinnati on the four truck line railroads that served the city. The largest number arrived on the L and N, the next largest on the Southern, then the B and O, the fourth railroad, the C and O, said Robinson, carried so few as to be almost a negligible factor. Of the 980 migrants who arrived in Cincinnati during the survey period, 314 had tickets to Cincinnati, while 666 were ticketed to points beyond. Of the 125 who arrived on the B&O, 70 were ticketed for Cincinnati, while 55 went on. Robinson thought that many of those who initially planned to stay in Cincinnati left. He estimated that 30,000 migrants had passed through Cincinnati in the past 12 months, but that only about 4,000 had settled in the city. I remember my paternal grandmother talking about um, their stop in Cincinnati, and they had planned to move on. Uh, I don't recall if it was uh, Michigan or where, but I think it was my grandmother that liked it in Cincinnati, so they stayed. But yes, they had planned to move further north than, uh, than staying here in Cincinnati. And B&O is being mentioned. My maternal grandfather um, worked on the B&O Railroad. For these newcomers to the city, the most pressing problem was adequate housing. Employment was not an immediate problem, for Robinson thought the migrants were either absorbed into the, com the common labor market or sent to other fields almost as soon as they arrived. And that's a quote. But also, a few shabby houses in the most crowded districts of the city were available. In addition, he reported that almost universal tendency to charge black tenants higher rents and, and I am sure that that is because the black, where blacks were concentrated, the effective tax rates, property tax rates, were increased. And the landlord passed that, that burden on to the uh, newly arriving black tenants and those who were already there. Um, and I am still looking for information on that. Um, but it's being mentioned here again, those high rents for, for black people in those shabby uh, dwellings. Robinson mentioned the work of a group called the Joint Housing Committee, which advertised its efforts to find housing for the newcomers with 300 real estate salesmen, but still had more applications for houses than what it could provide. In addition to his concern with the final destinations of the migrants, Robinson also investigated their religious and economic backgrounds. The colored man from the South, he noted, is a church-going man, and his presence is going to strengthen and animate the Negro religious life of the city in no small measure. And that's a quote. Of the 218 migrants he questioned, 146 belonged to a church, 87 were Baptist, 56 Methodist, and three he identified as holy, quote unquote. Many of the newcomers, Robinson said, had been property owners in the South. 
had bank accounts there and had worked at the same places for many years. Some, he added, had recommendations of a high order. Here and there, he added, was found also a professional man, usually a doctor or minister, and when asked why he was going north, one of them replied that he was following his practice. James Hathaway Robinson presented his final survey results and the program he had developed to the CSA's board early in January 1919. But he thought his work had significance beyond the borders of Cincinnati. He reported to his fellow social workers on his survey at the National Conference of Social Workers, 46th annual session held in Atlantic City, New Jersey, June 1st through the 8th, 1919, in a conference session titled The Negro and the Local Community. In his presentation, Robinson characterized Cincinnati as a northern city with southern exposure, a gateway between north and south, used alike by fugitive slave and free man of yesterday and the migrant of today in their quest of utopia. To the black, he said, utopia was a place where a man is a man. My God a place that is seemingly as much sought after but ever fleeting if ever existing land of nowhere. Where a man is a man. A place that is, quote, seemingly as much sought after but ever fleeting if ever existing land of nowhere. For more than a century, Robinson said, the North and the South had been meeting and discussing what should be done with blacks in a dialogue that treated the black as, quote unquote, an innocent bystander. Now with the creation of the CSA's Negro Civic Welfare Association, blacks themselves could finally play an active role in these discussions. As an example of this new cooperation, he pointed to the first project of the Negro Civic Welfare Association, the survey. Financed by the CSA, the survey had the endorsement of many important colored organizations in the city. But more important, he noted, the black organizations did more than simply lend their stamp of approval to the survey. They helped to conduct it. Heads of institutions, businessmen, and housekeepers, said Robinson, opened their doors for investigation, librarians rendered valuable assistance, and every conductor on the four southern railroads converging here kept a daily record of the migrants from the south destined for the city. Paid survey workers conducted house-to-house -house investigations assisted by the voluntary services of social workers. Also, 357 public school teachers conducted 20,000 telephone interviews. Mm, imagine telephone in the early 1900s. Collecting a mass of data that Robinson said would have been physically impossible to obtain elsewhere. The survey was truly a community undertaking. Robinson said the survey yielded several results. It helped to point out problems, teach about the work of social service agencies, create citywide interest, and provide the facts about conditions that would serve as leverage in readjusting the situation. Part of Robinson's undertaking in the current situation was based on a historical knowledge of Cincinnati's treatment of its black inhabitants. Although Ohio had never been a slave state, he wrote, and this is a quote, from the earliest days of its statehood, there began to grow up a set of laws creating a separate status for the Negro. 
end quote. In 1887, the Arnett Law made the black laws illegal. But Robinson found the effect of this legislation not entirely salutary. With the passage of the Arnett Law, Robinson claimed an important byproduct of the separate black institution, strong African-American leadership disappeared. In the three decades after the law went into effect, the old generation of capable leaders died out. Then came, quote, the influx of hordes from the South, white and colored, the one usually hostile and the other too often the less progressive type, end quote. Conditions in the city, he said, went from bad to worse. Robinson estimated that the city's current black residents numbered between 30 and 40,000. Since 1910, the population had more than doubled, and Cincinnati blacks were now, he said, primarily of southern birth. The black population in the city was not a normal social group. Demographically, for there were few children or old people and an unduly large number of persons in the prime of life. Robinson claimed that many of the problems of the group could be traced to the large number of male floaters, quote-unquote, a team that apparently referred to young men not anchored in family life. Robinson also expressed concern about the geographical dispersion of the black population, suggesting that people living in widely separated communities but facing essentially the same handicaps found themselves unable to join hands in the common cause of self-betterment. Hmm. Robinson thought that the working conditions of Cincinnati blacks limited in the main two, common labor at common laborer's pay, prevented the black worker from developing or striving for much of the incentive is lacking. The same necessity that forces him to accept the least desirable jobs at the poorest pay, Robinson said, also forces him to eat the poorest food and wear the shabbiest clothes, to live in the most unsanitary houses in the filthiest slums where he meets vice, poverty, disease, despair, and death. In a similar way, the community's abhorrent housing conditions were both physically unsafe and a danger to the stability of the black family. Robinson described two-thirds of the families he studied as proper, blood kinship families. The remaining one-third seemed to be forced by economic conditions to become part of a new and non-traditional social unit. This is a quote. Is the Negro family in the large city becoming less a group of people who live together because related by blood and bound by common traditions, he asked, and more an unrelated group forced together by high rents, low wages, and the scarcity of houses available to them? I'm going to read that again. Is the Negro family in the large city becoming less of a group of people who live together because related by blood and bound by common traditions, he asked, and more an unrelated group forced together by high rents, low wages, and a scarcity of houses available to them. We're just looking at 2019, back in 1916, 1917, only it has gotten worse. It has gotten worse. Because I think statistically, 
the majority of children are born out of wedlock. People that are just living together to survive. Uh, the men can't find work, gainful employment, so they latch on to a girl having children out of wedlock. Low wages, no wages, high rents in gentrifying communities where the renter has to eat the high rent because of the, the uh, taxes are high for the landlord. Same thing. It's the same thing. It hasn't changed. In examining the education available to the children of African American families, Robinson found that black children attended not only the two all-black schools, but all of the 59 elementary schools in the city. In the previous six years, 74 black students had graduated from high school, a figure that Robinson thought compared poorly with the record in other cities. Although he added that many of those graduates had taken further training, a small but growing number of black students was graduating from the university. And Robinson noted that, and this is a quote, the correspondence between this number and the increasing demand for teachers is suggestive, unquote. Robinson thought many students dropped out of school before graduating from high school because education did not seem to broaden the limited opportunities for employment. 2019. In his survey of employment opportunities, Robinson looked particularly at the problems of common laborers and the barriers to industrial work, but he also investigated the economic life of other segments of the black community. The black business community was not large, and he found it tended to be dominated by the small shops run by such entrepreneurs as undertakers, barbers, tailors, cobblers, beauticians, druggists, insurance men, grocers, caterers, newspaper editors, real estate agents, and printers. The professional class, on the other hand, was of considerable numbers and included doctors, dentists, lawyers, ministers, teachers, and social workers. Even among this more successful group, however, Robinson pointed out that various handicaps prevent the development of men of wide reputations. In a category he labeled organizations chiefly of the Negro's creation, Robinson listed 54 churches and missions, 84 fraternal societies, 22 federated clubs, 35 other societies worthy of note, and noted, and nearly a dozen philanthropic institutions. All of these, Robinson noted, seem to bespeak a powerful instinct for organization, an instinct that had been hampered from its foolish fullest expression by the lack of experience, vision, and other handicaps. He thought the black community had the potential to organize to meet its needs. It seemed only to lack leadership. In his description of the social problems facing the black citizens, Robinson stressed the casual role of discrimination. The city had, he said, a southern racial relationship that brought with it discrimination not only in employment opportunities, but also in amusement. Not only do hotels, restaurants, and soda fountains refuse to serve him, Robinson reported, but moving picture houses and private parks re refuse to admit him. Theaters segregate and often embarrass him. With limited exception, no schools, hospitals, or clinics allowed African Americans to train or practice as nurses or doctors. The black crime rate was 23% of the total rate, although the black population was only 7% of the total population. Robinson suggested that a noticeable factor in this rate is prejudice. The presumption, he argued, is invariable against the Negro, and he is often arrested and sentenced where others would be excused. Oh, 
my goodness. Is that happening right now or what? Or what? My goodness. In a similar manner, Robinson charged the press with giving undue publicity to his weaknesses, foibles, and crimes, while seldom mentioning black accomplishments and virtues. Same thing today. Look at television. They've got us plastered all over the media when it's something negative. Because they lack news value to the misinformed public. Brainwashed public really is what it is. You really shouldn't even be looking at the news. You really shouldn't. It's entertainment. It's entertainment. And it perpetrates hate. It perpetrates prejudice, discrimination. It just perpetrates it. Turn it off. Read a book. I'm going to read that again. In a similar manner, Robinson charged the press with giving undue publicity to his weaknesses, foibles, and crimes, while seldom mentioning black accomplishments and virtues because, and this is a quote from the media, because they lack news value to a misinformed public misinformed, don't believe the lies, don't believe the hype. Robinson also surveyed and evaluated the work of the social agencies concerned with the black situation. Eleven black agencies devoted themselves to work with black clients. And eight white agencies included special departments and workers objectively dealing with their problems. Their problems. Our problems. Not my problem. Robinson reported that some of the black agencies were more efficiently managed than others, but all have played an important role in the development of business experience, social vision, and group consciousness. Perhaps the biggest problem was a lack of centralized leadership. There was, he lamented, no agency at work with executive powers and a citywide interest, viewpoint, purpose, or propaganda to make effective any remedial recommendations that are made. On the basis of these criticisms, Robinson developed a program for future work that began with a federation of forces that would unify purpose, harmonize spirit, and promote efficiency. Robinson described the CSA as a financial federation of which the NCWA was a department charged with coordinating the work among colored people. The new Federation of Black Social Service Agencies included three child care institutions, two homes for the aged, two homes for young women, a YWCA and a YMCA, and the colored departments of eight white agencies. Additionally, new agencies devoted to community music and recreation, he added, would serve not merely as ends in themselves, but also to stimulate interest in the work-a-day features of this citywide program. The main features of the coordinating division were social service planning, institutional efficiency, financial campaigns, civic and central case conferences, an advisory group, would be created, composed of individuals representing groups ably advised on the Negro problems. The members would include black doctors, lawyers, ministers, and social workers. Finally, Robinson planned a great experience in Negro organization based in the churches. Church Federation, Robinson reported, had not been a success in Cincinnati, which suffered from rampant non-denominationalism, or, I'm sorry, rampant denominationalism, and the common interests which really exist 
have been overshadowed by smaller differences. Let me read it again. Finally, Robinson planned a great experience in Negro organization based in the churches. Church Federation, Robinson reported, had not been a success in Cincinnati, which suffered from rampant denominationalism and the common interests which really exist have been overshadowed by smaller differences. He did not propose trying to federate the churches on a religious basis. Instead, his goal was to a fe the federation of the auxiliary societies or social service departments of local churches with a common interest in social service. If that plan was successful, Robinson planned to expand the program to include clubs and fraternal societies. Fundamentally, Robinson stressed there is no reason why a group of people with common ills, common interests, and a common destiny could not be made to forget small differences and unite, not in religious work or fraternal work as such, but in social and civic work, which is our concern. Robinson's plan for social work in the black community did not take as a starting point the individual problems faced by those less fortunate people who needed the assistance of social agencies. He did not suggest that those people who lacked adequate housing, employment, or education had failed because of some lack of moral restitute or social or cultural defects or problems in character. Instead, he pointed the finger at larger social forces, such as the shift from a rural agricultural life to an urban industrial one in the family. One and the family stress caused by inadequate income and housing, problems against which a single individual could do little. His hope for the future improvement of the condition of the African American people lay in organizing at the institutions that served the community into a coherent whole and organizing among the individuals a sense of belonging to a community. His concerns reflected a feeling that the African American community needed more and better leadership and stronger institutions. However, Robinson also expressed a concern about the geographic dispersion of the city's black residents, the lack of a coherent black residential community, which seemed to him necessary for joint action. For Robinson, the stimulation of, gro of group consciousness and the development of organizations provided a, a route to improve the conditions faced by black citizens. Robinson called for self-organization of group consciousness among the city's black people and for a campaign of education among white people. Racial discrimination, Robinson thought, was based in white people's ignorance of black life. Amen. The Negro lives by himself, Robinson said, works by himself and when sick suffers by himself in the colored ward. When he dies, he is buried by himself, whether in a colored cemetery or the colored section of the potter's field. This separation meant that others learned little of the black citizen's life, little of his aspirations, handicaps, disappointments. The whites' lack of familiarity with black people led them to frequently distort facts and misunderstand the aims and motivations of African Americans. Instead of advocating residential and social integration, however, Robinson contended with the white community, contended that the white community should be taught the positive aspects of black life and culture. Such teaching of African American culture could become part of the program of social welfare agencies. Robinson was not alone in this effort to educate the white community about the culture of black citizen Cincinnatians. 
Wendell P. Abney, for example, in his preface to Cincinnati's Colored Citizens, 1926, explained that by setting forth the history and achievements of Cincinnati's black people, he would provide information that would go far to eradicate much of the prejudice that owes its origin to the ignorance or superficial knowledge of our white citizens. Dabney suggested that he strayed far from the cold, formal, stereotyped historical volume in efforts to show that the soul as well as the body of a people who are so little known, so little understood, and for so many years so much oppressed because of such misunderstanding. By the early 1920s, Robinson and his Negro Civic Welfare Association changed to committee in 1921, had become an integral part of Cincinnati's social welfare planning apparatus. Robinson reported on this growing cooperation between the NCWC and other agencies in a summary of his agency's accomplishments between 1919 and 1921. After completing the survey of black conditions in 1917, the NCWA turned its attention to coordinating and developing social work in the black community. This included encouraging white agencies to expand their work into that community with the use of black social workers, thank you, improving the financial basis of the all-black agencies and upgrading the personnel of the workers in the colored field. Thank you. The NCWA also began using community centers to educate the public, drawing it into a clearer and deeper appreciation of the social service program. The NCWA undertook fundraising for the community chest in the black community and initiated direct social service activities with a view of turning them over later to other agencies. This man was a, a real prophet, a forward thinker, was he not? And very much in tune to the reality of what was going on, the underpinnings uh, not surface at all, and bold enough to speak it, to proclaim it and make it known. Hallelujah. Robinson's program of combining social service organizations with a campaign to build, build understanding about the African-American condition and appreciation for black culture provided a framework for the work of the NCWA and its successor organizations for the next 30 years. In the 1920s, Robinson and the NCWC set the groundwork for the development of special programs for African Americans in public recreation and public health. Like the NCWC, the Division of Negro Recreation, which was a component component part of the Cincinnati Recreation Commission, CRC, created at the inception of the commission in 1927, not only made social, sociological studies of the needs of the black community, but also developed special programs to meet those needs in the areas of athletics, drama, and music. Just as Robinson enlisted the aid of the black community in making his survey in 1917, so professional black recreation and culture. And cultural workers in the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s relied on the black community as well. One example of this was the annual Negro Music Festival of the 1930s and 1940s, organized by a community advisory group under the aegis of the Cincinnati Public Recreation Commission. These events celebrated black musical culture and brought to Cincinnati nationally prominent performers such as Paul Robeson to sing in the city's parks. In the public health arena, 
the Shoemaker Health and Welfare Center established by Robinson provided both health care to the black residents of the West End and clinical practice opportunities for black nurses and doctors at a time when they were excluded from practicing in white hospitals. Throughout the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s, this model of combining the provision of social welfare programs with the organization of the black community guided African-American social work. The Negro Civic Welfare Committee in 1935 com became the Division of Negro Welfare of the Council of Social Agencies, 1935 to 1949. Throughout the years... And throughout the years and the name changes, however, Robinson's vision of how to organize the black community remained constant. Only in the late 1940s did it begin to change as racial integration rather than community self-development became the tactic for racial advancement. That's important. In 1949, the Division of Negro Welfare became the Cincinnati Urban League, making formal an implicit connection that had existed since Robinson began his work in 1917, but also making a step toward a new direction, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. I'm terribly sorry if you hear the dog barking in the background. That's my neighbor's dog. Bless his little heart. So thank you for joining me in the reading or the listening, hearing of this chapter, James Hathaway Robinson. I'd never heard of him before. He did a phenomenal work. He needs recognition. Don't ever see him mentioned in Black History Month, February, which should be all year round. So mark that name, James Hathaway Robinson, mark that name and the impact that he played in developing social services and social agencies and just the, the, the amalgamation and, and, and collaboration uh, along with white agencies in Cincinnati. My God, that, that was uh, amazing. So I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for Chapter 9. I uh, don't know what the title of it is at this moment, but check back in with me and we'll see what it is. I'm sure it's good. The whole book has been great. Have a good one. Be blessed. Bye-bye.